And if we have met What? <laughs> what is this day? This is a day? Hi, welcome to Fiber Love Diary. I'm Trish, if we haven't met. And if we have met, welcome back. So some of you will remember this warping mill from a video, I don't know, a couple back, maybe three back, I'm not even sure. I'm working on three videos concurrently right now and I'm getting myself confused. And also I'm wondering if this is not my best way to go, but it's just making me feel like I'm like just treading water, but I'm not actually, I'm running but I'm not getting anywhere, you know what I mean? A number of you asked questions about the warping mill and if I would make a video on it specifically, how to wind a warp on it. I'm going to, but I just wanna say this first. I bought this warping mill actually so that I could wind super, super long hanks to, to dye self-striping yarn. So I'm just gonna wind one for you guys today. Ever since I did that video where I did the three scarves on one like medium gray, kind of a charcoal warp, I felt like that would compete with the hand spun colors a little bit less. This time I'm gonna use white and I'll just use colors that I think will work better with a white warp. It's just what I decided to do. I actually would like to do a black one as well, but I don't, I can't spare the black yarn right now. <laughs> I have black yarn, but I'm using it for a different project. And so in the moment, I don't have black yarn that I can use for this. So I'm gonna do a white, this is a hink of Malabrigo sock. Um, that's the other thing with that hand spun. I wanna compete with the hand spun as little as possible. So that's why I'm using a heddle that would normally, not exactly normally, but, normally be made for a, a yarn more like a number four or a worsted and it's because I want the um I want the warp to kind of disappear so that that hand spun weft is the superstar before I start winding this I do need to put this in a cake I mean I guess I could go straight off my swift but that's just asking for like tangles and problems like that so I'm gonna wind this into a cake really quickly and then we'll start winding it's really not hard at all but you need to know some little like tips and tricks and secrets all right so what I'm gonna use for this warp is a cone of sock yarn that I have for dyeing this one is um I'll have to look up the fiber content exactly. But I can't remember if I actually know. I think I actually bought one breed of wool and nylon for this one, and it's a favorite. So I'm going to use it right off the cone, and if I encounter any knots, then I'll just show you how I deal with those while I'm winding a warp, and I have to figure out how to get the camera set up so I can, hmm, how am I gonna do that? <laughs> okay, we'll figure it out. It is not very heavy. But I do, um, I clamp it to the corner of the table the same way because you really don't want it to move. You're gonna have some tension on it. It comes with its own clamps, but I just prefer these kind. But you know, whatever works for you and your table that you're using will be fine. Okay because they really hold it on tightly. And I mean, I love Ashford, but those clamps are not always my favorite thing. I'm just telling you the truth. I always tell you guys the truth, even though sometimes it kind of bites me. <laughs> okay. So the way that you're gonna start, you can start at the bottom. There is the same configuration of pegs and on the Ashford warping mill, this peg is mobile. It's for the end and it's got, let me show you, it's got, a wing nut that you can just loosen and that peg will drop and that will help you get your warp off at the end if you use it and it has one at each end okay so I'm gonna start with this peg and I'm gonna create a cross if you watched the last video you saw me do that already and then I'm gonna follow this guide string down. So what I did, and you should probably refer to that other video if you wanna see how this part is, but what I did is I wanted an 8.2 yard warp. 
So I measured a piece of yarn, and this is cotton yarn, so hopefully it'll stretch a little bit less. It still stretches a little, but it's not bad. And I measured a piece of cotton worsted yarn that is the length that I want. Just You can use anything that's not super stretchy. I wound it onto my warping mill so that I would have a guide that would be the length that I want it to be. Um, so that is why there's already a string on here. This string is eight, it's actually a little more than 8.2 yards. I always like to err on the side of having too much yarn rather than not enough. So I added a little tiny bit of extra, um, what will be waste yarn. That is why there's already a string on here and what we're gonna do is use it as a guide. And for this warp, I want it to be 10 inches wide and it's 7.5 strands per inch. So I'm gonna do 75 strands because it's just 10 inches wide times the EPI ends per inch, which is 7.5, that equals 75, easy. When I make a scarf, I like them wider. That's just me, you can do whatever you like. But if you're doing something that's very wide and has a ton of strands, you may want to do this in like multiple runs. So like if I'm doing a dish towel that has 400 and something ends, I will divide it in three and do three of these chained warps because it's just, if you want to do a lot of length, they end up being too close together and too smushed on there and it's not good for when you're actually warping your loom. So I'm just telling you like do it in a couple sections and that actually is nice for you because you can take a break in between, come back and wind the rest later. You know, it's kind of nice. So my top peg, I like to start at the top, but again, the configuration is the same at the bottom. And so you can start at the bottom. And what I do is make a loop and then I use that to do an overhand knot because that won't let go. If possible, I like to do these all in one, um, like sitting is not the right one session. And that's just because you're gonna hold your tension a certain kind of way when you start. And it, if you just keep going, your tension is more likely to just be the same and be even. Could it be the same later? Hopefully it would be. But don't get crazy. Like that doesn't mean you can never set your yarn down. You can stop and I'll show you how to do that too. If you saw the video that inspired this use, you know that your cross when you are warping is very important. What I did is set my guide strand up so that I remember how I always start. I recommend if you're gonna start doing this, you, like find yourself a method that you can remember and just use it all the time. So I always go over the first peg, under the second peg, and then I go over the last peg all the time. So I'll show you, it's kind of confusing, but I'm creating my cross. So when I start out, I always go over, under, okay. And then this is always gonna be over, this last peg in the three, peg series and then I just follow my string down and you'll see I use my left hand to push it's gonna be in the way I'll use my left hand to push the strand up to the guide string so I'm going all the way on this guide and I am counting, but you really, I mean, for a warp this small, there's tricks for that too, so I'll show you. So at the bottom, I do not worry about a cross. Some people cross at the bottom too. I don't ever have a use for that. So I go right to, hang on, I gotta go even lower with this thing. Okay. I go right to where the end of my guide string is, it's on this peg, you can see the loop, right? Go under it and then go back up. And I use my right hand in this case to kind of scoop when I get past each of these little like legs, I'll scoop the threads, put a little bit of pressure, but I'm not really putting any pressure on, but I'll scoop it 
so that I am kind of close up, but you ne you do not want to cross them. I know it probably seems nitpicky, and there are people who don't worry about this part, but I am telling you, when you actually warp your loom, it makes a difference, even that tiny bit of length difference. Okay, so we're back at the top. I'm gonna show you how to do this. So I wanna go over again this last, this third peg when we started, always over that one. And then I wanna change so it's gonna be over, under. And you can see, yep, you can see it. The first thread matched the guide thread and it went over, under, and then over. This is always, this third one is always in an over. And for me anyway. And then when I come back, I cross everything. So again, I go over, under. So that's why I'm saying like, tell yourself I'm always gonna go over, under, or I'm always gonna go under, over. It doesn't matter which one. I don't think it matters. But just, you wanna always do the same one. So then I go all the way to the guide thread and then go back the way I started. So over, under, and then over the last one. So we've got two, this is three. I'm gonna show you just a couple more. Here we are, we're at the bottom. Okay, now again, we're at the bottom. I'm still making sure that at this post, I'm underneath and I'm gonna go over, under, the same. I always do it all that way. So this is four. And honestly, the first time you do it, you guys just pull the video up and like pause it play it over, do whatever, because it took me forever. Over, under, so that's four. Come back to the first peg and then start again. So we've got four done. I'm just gonna kind of fly through this. If you wanna stop, which I'm about to stop so I can move the camera so you can see like the whole thing, um, all you need to do for whatever reason, like if I'm gonna cut something and cut a knot out or whatever, I go back to the beginning or the end and I wind this around multiple times so that you secure it because you wanna keep your tension on and your tension the same throughout the whole thing. If you're doing a huge number of these and you don't wanna count your ends, I don't really like to count that much but I probably will end up counting. One thing you can do that's kinda helpful is you can take a different colored yarn, let me grab a piece and then you actually put it in your cross. Right now I have four strands in my cross. So what I would do is hang this over and then every time I reach a 10 or a one inch section or something that I can remember, I will just cross it in the cross like this and that will help you count because you can come back and say, oh, okay, I was going by tens and I have three crosses so I already have 30 done that kind of thing. If you're doing a huge warp or you just don't want to count, this can be a really handy little tip, the little crossing threads every inch. So I'm not going to use it though. So. <laughs> I just don't use one of those. Okay, so we're at four. This is five. Okay, I've taken this off the post. This is the end of my warp. And, oh, see, I'm already. And I'm holding it with the back of this arm. I just hold it with different body, whatever works to keep the tension on the warp. That's how I like to start. And then I will just start, I will like twist it on the end and then start a crochet chain. And I, again, like I said, I just keep it very, very tight in the tension.
and this crochet chain is also pretty tight that's just how I like it to keep that tension the way that you know it was so I let when I pull the new loop up I let it pull the tension out of the old loop I'm all the way up to the top. What I'm going to do is hang this over the peg and then get one more yarn because if you, with your crochet loop, if you put anything through it really and then tie it, it'll stop itself from unchaining. So we'll just tie it. there and that way you can maneuver it around while you're getting it on your loom and you don't have to worry that it's going to pull itself out and unchain but so it's all chained up looking beautiful and we're ready to take it to the loom i hope it helps you like use this for those purposes i will be doing a self-striping yarn with this soon because now i'm feeling the itch to get it done I've had it for like two years and I still haven't done it, even though that's what I bought it for. So that will be a little bit different of a wind and I will show you how that works as well. So here is our beautiful, you can just take all of it off now. We're done. I just wanted to show, see how tight this is um, chained? There's no loopiness in this. And also I wanted to show because I lost a little section of video where I was tying the cross I wanted to show this really well. So you are going to tie all four legs of your cross and that is what orders the yarns the way that they're going to be plucked off the, um, the lee sticks. Again, some of that will make more sense if you actually reference the other video, but this tight chaining is going to keep those threads from being able to do this while you're trying to warp and that is what frequently causes tangles. When I actually transfer it to my loom I only unchain maybe two feet at a time and that also keeps it from being able to rub against each other and tangle each other up. So this is a great way if Physically, you have some limitations to direct warping something this long or like space-wise, you have some limitations to warping this long. It's a good option. I hope this helps one of you. Next week, I bought a couple fleeces and we're gonna be sampling some fleeces from a farm in North Carolina. So I will see you guys next week. I hope you have a great one. The rest of this week is devoted to taxes. Thanks, I love you, bye.